Today's reading of scripture will be from John 15, verses 1 through 11 in the English Standard Version. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you could do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is the word of God. James James says in his New Testament letter that reading the Bible is like looking in a mirror. And I bet you experience that as you, as you read the Bible every day, as you come to services, as you meet in Bible studies. The Bible reveals things inside of us. But James says, what good is it if you look in a mirror, see something, and then immediately walk away and forget what you look like? So today we're going to recap what we've been studying in John 14 through 17 uh, for, the, for the last three and a half months. As a reminder of what we've seen, we've looked in this mirror We've looked in this part of scripture, and hopefully the Lord has shown us some things, so we don't want to be like those people who walk away and immediately forget what we've seen. It's um, it's probably like every public speaker's great fear that like there's something on your nose or something, you know, that you didn't notice and that you get up here, so don't you start fidgeting with your noses at me now. Um, We won't have that. But the point of a mirror is to see, I gave up on trying to keep my hair straight a long time ago, so that, that, that's a losing battle. But you hope that you see things and then you don't have anything distracting, you know, and isn't this the reality in our lives? That we pray that the Lord would speak to us through his word, show us anything that's out of place, that we might honor him in all that we do. John 15 has been really our key passage, and John 15, 5 in particular, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's been our key verse and key passage for this whole series. And our prayer is, as leaders of the church, our prayer is that we will never outgrow that. That this will become so much a part of who we are as a church. We're a church that abides. That recognizes Jesus is the Lord. He is our source of life and direction and power and peace and love. And apart from him, we can do nothing. So we're a praying church. We're a church that recognizes our dependence on God's word to hear from him and be close with him. Jesus began this section called the Olivet Discourse because he's on the Mount of Olives, about to go and pray and then be arrested and betrayed. And he begins this discourse with his disciples by saying, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. The disciples had plenty of reason to be troubled. Jesus kept saying things like, I'm leaving. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men and he will suffer and die. They had many reasons to to be troubled, to be concerned. Opposition and persecution had been escalating for the last year of Jesus' ministry, they knew that there were threats out to arrest and execute Jesus. And what happened to their rabbi, they feared, would very quickly happen to each of them, which is why when Jesus was arrested, they scattered. They ran literally for their lives. They had a lot of reason to be troubled, and they had little clues to have hope because Jesus said the Son of Man will be arrested and 
executed, but on the third day he will rise. But who knew what that meant? They couldn't understand the promises and the hope that Jesus was giving them. He talked about a helper he would send to comfort and to guide them. But who could understand these promises of resurrection and the Holy Spirit? But Jesus points them to the foundational commitment of faith. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He said, yes, I'm going, but I'm going so I can prepare a place for you. And I'll come back, take you to myself. Where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. This whole thing, Jesus says, is about a relationship. I have to go and prepare. And what was the preparation Jesus had to do? He had to go and die on a cross. He had to prepare us so that we could dwell with him eternally. I have to go to finish this work the Father has given me so that we can be together forever. You know the way. Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How can we possibly know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the whole Gospel of John is built on these seven I am statements that the Lord Jesus made. That he is the bread that we eat to have eternal life. He is the light that shows us the truth of who God is and who we are in the light of that holiness. He is the door to salvation. He is the good shepherd who calls and his sheep hear his voice and respond to his call. He is the resurrection and the life. Not only do we believe in him and have our sins forgiven, but he is the one who conquered sin and death forever and raises us to eternal life in him. He is the way the way to follow the Lord, the way of salvation. He is the fullness and embodiment of all truth. He is the life of God now in the flesh of man. He is the true vine. As we abide in him, he fills us with his fruit. And so what we'll see today is the the summary of this whole section, John 14 through 17, in our four spiritual life commitments. And uh, there's copies of that on the back if you don't have one in front of you, but this is, we'll just walk through as a recap of this beautiful section of scripture, the four commitments. And at the end of the service today, we'll invite you as the Lord leads to stand and restate for some of us, or for the first time, state these commitments publicly to say, we will trust Jesus, worship Jesus, walk with Jesus, work with Jesus. And it's significant. We stand together to say, we will And the worksheet, as you look at it, on the back says, I will. So you prayerfully discern what it looks like for you. We're not telling you what it looks like. We're inviting you to pray and meet with a couple other believers and work out in this season of life, what does it mean for you to trust Jesus completely? Because I can guarantee you this, whatever your life stage, whatever your circumstance, there is something right now, maybe 10 things, for which you are having to trust Jesus completely. This is part of why we meet together, why we have small groups, both both large and small, is because our hearts are often troubled. This world we live in, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. The word there is tribulation. But here he says, let not your hearts be troubled. The answer to troubling circumstances is faith. And the key word in this is we will trust Jesus completely. Completely. That's the kicker of it, right? It's one thing to say, Jesus, we trust you. And he says, completely? Do we trust in the Lord with all of our heart? Or do we often say, Lord, I trust in you mostly for some of these things. The foundation of any relationship is trust. And trust grows the more you know the character of the person, which is what Jesus says He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The whole Bible is God's revelation of himself to his people. And Jesus came as the fullness and finality of that revelation. If you've seen me, he says, you've seen the Father. That's why he says, believe in God, the Father, but also believe in me. Haven't I walked with you for three years? Haven't you seen how I encourage you, how I love, how I serve? The more you're with someone, the more you know their character, the more you will naturally trust 
in them. And the way we trust in Jesus is through enduring, biblically grounded faith. How do you get to know the character of God? It is through this incredible book that he's given to us. That we can go back, back all the way to the beginning of time, all the way to the beginning of his relationship with Israel. We can read all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament, and every, every single verse, every passage of Scripture shows us another window into the goodness and faithfulness and holiness and grace of our God. The more you know God, the more you will come to trust in him, and your heart will be less troubled and more peaceful. And he says, Truly I say, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I'll do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is one of the most striking passages in the whole Bible, that Jesus gives us this promise, an exhortation to pray. If we trust in Jesus completely, we will be people of prayer because we know his work matters much more than ours. We often flip that and think our work matters more than his. But if we really trust in him and we really know him, then we will be quick to pray. Whenever we are worried and concerned, our first impulse will be to pray, to bring it to the Lord, to cast our burdens upon him. And these promises, Scripture is filled with promises like this. This is the, the first two out of six times in these four chapters that Jesus exhorts his followers to pray, to ask in his name, believing that the Father will hear and will answer. So brothers and sisters, here's our first commitment to trust in the Lord Jesus completely because we know him. We know his character. We know his goodness and faithfulness. Second commitment is to worship Jesus passionately. If you love me, he says, you will keep my commandments. Jesus made it clear that his primary love language, his primary love language is obedience. To love him is to walk with him, to know his word and to follow it. The more you know Jesus, the more you will love him. The more you love him, the more you will obey him. This is the truth for all parents who raise children. Our love language is obedience. As parents, we know just a little better than these kiddos, and we give them instructions for their good, and that's how God feels about us. He's given us all of these instructions for our good if we will just trust and obey. And so how do we worship Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? It's through specific disciplines of joy that prioritize quality time with him. Jesus says, I'll ask the Father. He'll give you another helper to be with you forever. The first of many promises of the Holy Spirit's coming and presence and encouragement and guidance with us as we learn to hear his voice and invest the time in our relationship with God. We, we know this in every part of our life. If you want to get better at something, you have to put in the time. Does a concert violinist resent the time needed to practice in order to perfect that craft? Does the athlete resent time in the gym or on the field to train and prepare for the next game? Does the PhD candidate resent time in the library and studying? I mean, it's part of the preparation. Does the business person get annoyed with the time put into the office in order to prepare and do the work? We all know in order to see a return, you have to make an investment. And this is nowhere more true than in our relationships. A marriage takes investment of time and attention, of love and affection. Parenting takes quality time. One of our elders is fond of saying that quality time happens in the midst of quantity time. Relationships need an investment. And it's the same with the Lord. If you want your relationship with him to grow, if you want to know him more, trust him more, love him more, it takes a commitment of time. And the term that goes with that time with the Lord is spiritual discipline. To develop holy habits that allow you to have that quality time with the Lord. 
The Holy Spirit is there to help us, to guide us, to help us understand. And that's what the Spiritual Life Worksheet is really about. It's a tool for you to work with the Holy Spirit and one or two trusted Christian friends to discern what are the habits that are most helpful for you. And that doesn't mean to just do whatever your mom and dad did or do whatever some hero inspired what they did. Martin Luther got up every morning at four in the morning and prayed for three hours. I would guess most of us do not embrace the habits of medieval German monks. Some of you might, but you know, they went to bed at seven, you know, they went to bed with the sun. So getting up at four or five in the morning was normal for those times. So don't take the practices of some heroic person and let that become a burden to you for what you don't do. Listen to the Holy Spirit for what he's asking you to do. And as you, as you meet and share with another Christian, what you'll find is there's so many, there's such a variety. It's like any relationship, if you're going to go spend time with your, your child or grandchild, do you agonize over the activity? Does it matter if you're going to go to a ball game or get ice cream or if you're just going to go for a walk or if you're going to shoot baskets? It doesn't matter the activity, right? You're looking to that child to say, what do you want to do? I just want to spend time with you. This is what God says to each of us. It doesn't matter the activity, the venue. Pick up your Bible, find a place, find a time, and simply spend time with your Father in heaven. And as any discipline shows you, the more time you put in, the more freedom and joy you experience. The, the athlete who does the little disciplines finds more freedom on the field. The musician who puts in the practice finds more freedom in the performance. The academic, the business person, the medical professional, the teacher, the more you work on your trade, the more freedom you experience in it, and the more fruit that will come. Here's the promise of John 15. Again, our key verse for this series. I'm the vine, Jesus says. You're the branches. Whoever abides in me, to abide, to dwell, to focus, to attend, abiding in Jesus, and I in him, him abiding in us, that's the one who bears much fruit. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. And notice the result is not only fruit in us, but especially the fruit of joy. If you feel like Bible reading and prayer and fasting and meeting with other believers, if these feel like burdensome disciplines to you, you're not doing them right. It's like date night with your spouse. This should not be burdensome. You're not doing it right. It should be joyful. It should nourish the relationship. These things I've spoken to you, Jesus says, that my joy may be in you. What is Jesus' joy like? What's his joy like? It is eternal infinite, overflowing, the, the joy that comes from loving relationship. This is what comes from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is the joy that he wants to be in us, that our joy may be full. So we trust Jesus completely. We seek to worship him passionately through disciplines and third commitment. We will walk with Jesus faithfully. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you Love one another as I have loved you. Jesus made it very simple for his followers. He boiled down all of his commandments and all of the Bible into two overriding commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. You do those two things, he said, you will be obeying the rest of the law. Love God with all that you are. Don't hold out. Don't compartmentalize. Don't hide certain parts. Love him with every part of your being. And by the way, love your neighbor, the person beside you. This is my commandment. He summed it all up for his disciples. He says, I'm going to give you a new commandment in John 13, right before this section. He washes their feet and he says, that is your example. Humble service. Now just love each other. Don't fight with each other. Don't compete with each other. Love each other. You're my friends, he says, if you do what I command you. He, he, and you know, in the mind of Jesus, he's like, I'm leaving. I'm going to the Father. I'm going to intercede and pray for you. The Holy Spirit's going to be in you and following you. But you, you have to love each other. Walking with Jesus faithfully. He says, you didn't choose me. I chose you and I appointed you. Why? For what purpose? To go and bear fruit, fruit specifically that will last, that will abide. Fruit has two meanings. First, an internal fruit, a fruit of character development that we become more like Jesus as we spend time with him. And then the fruit of impact that people experience 
the love and the joy that comes out of us as we learn to walk with Jesus and do as he did. Now, you've probably noticed that there's overlap between these four commitments, to trust Jesus and worship him and walk with him. Yes, there's intentional overlap of these things. What this third commitment adds to the second one that involves spiritual disciplines, this one adds relationship. Our spiritual formation is greatly enhanced through relationship with other believers. This is why Oakwood for decades has been committed to small groups. Believers grow best in community. It's the soil in which we flourish and greater fruit is found. You need one or two. You, some of us are more extroverted and we need 15 or 20, right? But some of you just need one or two people who's going to call you and encourage you and text you with verses and let, them, let you know that they're praying for you throughout the day. But that key word, formation. All of us need an intentional formation process, a training program. You know, it's true that they say, this is true of anything in life and in business and in ministry. Your current system, what you do, your current system is perfectly designed for the results you're getting. Have you heard that? Whatever you're doing is the perfect system for the results you're seeing in your life. So take the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If your system of spending time with the Lord, of cultivating those spiritual disciplines, being in relationship and ministry, if what that is doing in you is producing in you endless supplies of love, of joy, of peace, of patience, if all of that is what's growing in your life, then write a book, please, and give a seminar so the rest of us can learn from you. I think most of us here would say, we see a little of that fruit, but we would love to see more. We would love to see the gardens of our lives really flourishing in this and not being like the garden outside my house that is, we had to just rip up yesterday, it's so full of weeds. Hopefully that's not a metaphor of our hearts, but often that's how it feels. We can feel very dry and disconnected. We can feel like the thorns of life are overcrowding any sense of spiritual life. And this is why you need to meet with one or two other believers to pray with you and for you and to discern that process of spiritual formation. What's going to be most helpful for you? Some of us need more time with people. You might need less time with people. Some might need more time outside in creation. Some might need more time in a quiet room inside without distractions. Some might need more ministry, more opportunities to serve people. Some of you have too much activity, and you need to prune those things out. That's what having a brother or sister beside you can help you discern. And the Holy Spirit has promised to guide us into all truth, reminding us of the teachings of Jesus and guiding us into exactly the opportunities for growth and ministry that he has for us. And as we walk with Jesus, what we find is that he invites us to work with him as well. When the helper comes, he will bear witness about me. And guess what? You will also bear witness. Opportunities to work with Jesus, who remember he said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And so working with Jesus, he's like the strong, experienced ox, you know, and we're like the young one who's just learning to put our shoulder into that yoke and join him in plowing the field. Sometimes ministry can feel like the hard work of plowing up very hardened ground, right? But we don't do it alone. The Lord Jesus invites us to come with him, to be in step with him. And then even the hard work is rewarding in our fellowship with him. So the lesson here is we learn to work with Jesus is you have to be yourself in the kingdom of God. There is no other you. Don't try to be someone else. Be exactly who you are. You may not be surprised to know that I talk for a living. And so often my ministry involvement in the world is talking to people. I like to talk to people. Some of you don't like to talk to people, and you, you, you know, you wear the shirt like too many people, you know. Um, so those of you who are more about service and hands-on work, that's the calling for you, is find ways to love and serve people in 
quiet ways. Some of you are much better at listening. If you're not as much about talking, you're probably much better at listening. You just sit down with someone and ask how they're doing. Some of you are very gifted with hospitality and love to have people in your home and to share a meal and prepare a meal. If you're, if you're into golf, then play golf with people and see how they're doing. If you crochet, make little squares and give them out. I don't know what. <laughs> if you sew, here's what you find. Whatever you're interested in, your ministry will be multiplied if you find other people who share that area of interest. So like, like if, you, if you sew, there's a group here of ladies who make dresses and send them to Cuba and Africa and all over the world using their, their time and their, they find fabric wherever they find it, and they make these little dresses. So whatever it is that you do, some of us love soccer and we use soccer for Jesus, a way to connect with, uh, with other guys who in, enjoy soccer. Whatever, whatever you enjoy, whatever you have experience in, use that for the kingdom. That's what, that's what the Holy Spirit will lead you to do. In uh, all this uh, crisis response stuff with the hurricane, um, one, of my, one of my pastor friends down in Apollo Beach is named Tom Campbell. We've been uh, a, a part of, been connected for six years through our annual prayer summit and pastor gatherings. And um, Tom's a retired CB from the Navy. So he was a project organizer for the Navy for years, and he was able through that to retire uh, at a relatively young age. And being a, a, a veteran himself, he got involved in the South Shore VFW and has been for, I think, six or seven years, the coordinator for the VFW and their different activities and outreach to veterans. And through that, got involved in the local chamber of commerce. So that, the South Shore, this is like Riverview, Apollo Beach, like that stretch south of us. Um, through, through that, the chamber of commerce in COVID set up a little website, I think they called it South Shore Strong, something like that, where people in the area could post needs. I need water, I need toilet paper. And other people could see that and say, I have that, and they would bring it. And it became a way to share needs and resources and coordinate response. So after COVID faded out, that kind of went away. But when Helene came in and the storm surge, Apollo Beach was one of the most impacted by Helene. Not only water that came in with storm surge, but it brought, it brought tons and tons of sand into the homes along Apollo Beach. And so they reactivated that. through the, This is, again, this is the Chamber of Commerce. And one of the programs in that is the VFW. So Tom just found himself, through his experience, through his involvement with the VFW, he found himself in the middle of this regional response. And the church was like, was a part of it, but it really had very little to do with the church. It had everything to do with just good-hearted citizens who knew there was flooding over here, there's tree damage over here. And he was able to help coordinate through that chamber of commerce hundreds, I think they got to over 3,000 homes they were able to serve just through people saying, I have a need, I have a chainsaw, and connecting those two things with each other. So uh, Tom uh, just, just came up to share some of that uh, this week, and so the, the story is, is fresh in my mind. But the, the point of that is he just, he used his experience and his connections it was very natural for him. Like it would, I'm not a military veteran, so for me to get involved in VSW would be kind of odd. I play soccer. Tom followed his, his interest and his experience, and as this developed, he, he was an organizer by trade with the Navy. So it was very natural for him to say, I could play this role in the kingdom, and he continues to do that as obviously the work is ongoing. Let's remember in our, in our ministry with the Lord, that it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict people, not ours. He's the one who convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then the reminder here as we work with Jesus to continue to pray, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And the main thing we pray is Jesus' prayer in John 17. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me. Now, Father, glorify me. And the way we glorify Jesus is by lifting up his name in good words and good deeds, and he's given us this promise and this, this prayerful export, exhortation that we would all be one, the same as the Father and the Son are one, that we also would be in them, that the world would believe. This is our calling to answer Jesus' prayer. And so here's our summary of these spiritual life commitments. To trust Jesus completely is the foundation of our relationship with him. From that trust, as we grow to know him, 
we will increasingly worship him and love him with all of our hearts, cultivating these practices that help us feel closer to him, and we'll walk with him. The more we love him, the more we'll obey his commands and love each other and love our neighbor and work with him in his kingdom ministry. And then there's the extra details that we will say when we stand and say together. We're going to introduce a new song. Um, after we stand and say our commitments together, we're going to introduce a new song today that came out of John 17. John 17, 22 um, is, is just such a striking verse when Jesus says, the glory that you've given me, talking to the Father, the glory you've given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as, as we are one. What is the glory that Jesus has, has given us? The, that thought prompted this song that the um, worship team put together for us to close out this series. This will be the bridge that we'll sing at the end of the song. The glory of God, you can sum up in these seven attributes of God, his power, the power that spoke this universe into being, his wisdom that designed all of history and especially salvation in history, his justice that taught the Israelites and then in Jesus, taught them what holiness was about, what justice and righteousness would look like, the mercy, the justice and mercy that met at the cross is now inside of us in the glory of the Lord Jesus, the faithfulness of the Son to do what he sees the Father doing, the goodness of God now implanted in us, and all of this bound together in the love of God. What does it mean that the glory the Father gave the Son, he has given to us. It means much more than this. These seven attributes of God are not the fullness of the glory. The glory is all of the fullness of God inside of us, but it at least means these seven things. How can we keep these spiritual commitments to trust Jesus completely, to worship him passionately, to walk with him faithfully and work with him diligently? Brothers and sisters, we can't. We can't possibly keep those promises apart from the resources God has given us in himself, in his son, in the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus said. The glory you've given me, Father, I've given to them that they may be one and that the world might believe as we see that unity. So if you would, let's, this is the statement that we're going to say. Very clear, very simple. For the glory of God through the power of his spirit. So recognizing this is not something you're going to do on your own, in your own strength, for your own glory. This is all for the glory of God and the power of his spirit. And we'll, we'll stand together. Now, um, you are welcome to remain seated. You are welcome to stand and to not voice this out loud. If you're not ready to make this commitment, the Bible is clear. It's better not to make a vow than to make a vow and not mean it. But if you are ready, if you feel like this represents your heart and desire, um, it, it might, it's, it's possible there's someone here who hasn't made a clear and decisive commitment to the Lord Jesus. And if you stand, and I'll just warn you, if you stand and say this, you're committing to Jesus. That's what, that's, that's what it looks like. All this misses from a salvation prayer is repentance. So you can just do that on your own. I repent. And I'm going to trust Jesus completely and worship him and walk with him. And then this could be your moment of, of commitment to Jesus and, and salvation like the guys were sharing about today when they came to their turning points to trust in Jesus. So would you stand with me now and let's together make this restatement or initial statement of our, our commitment to the Lord Jesus. Together, let's say, for the glory of God through the power of his spirit by abiding in Christ we will trust Jesus completely. We will worship Jesus passionately. We will walk with Jesus faithfully. We will work with Jesus diligently. Lord Jesus, we praise you as the giver of every good gift, as the giver of every spiritual blessing. We, we praise you that the glory the Father gave you, you've given to us in yourself, in the person of your Holy Spirit, that we would have your power, your wisdom, your justice, your mercy, your goodness and faithfulness, your love flowing in us and through us. And we praise you for that gift. We could never be worthy of that. We could never have earned that. But in the fullness of your grace, you have given us everything for our life and love and flourishing and salvation. We recognize, Lord Jesus, apart from you, we can do nothing. 
but with you, we can bear much fruit for your glory. And that's our desire, Lord Jesus. Each of us individually, we want to honor you and bear much fruit for you. As a church, Oakwood Church, we want to be fruitful. We want to see many more like Alan and John whose lives are changed and begin to bear fruit for you. We want to see that for our city of Tampa Bay, that the church of Tampa Bay would be one and would be fruitful and that your name, Lord Jesus, would be high and lifted up here. Help us, Lord, to keep these promises that we've made to each other and to you for your glory and your strength. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.